Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 60. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Do you love vintage cars? Then go to CarsYeah.com and get a free copy of the fantastic Filler Up book. It's a full-color ebook filled with fuel filler fun with over 60 color photographs of vintage cars plus inspirational quotes from some of the most famous automotive enthusiasts of all time. Simply go to CarsYeah.com, click on the free book button on the homepage, and download your Filler Up book today. It's free at CarsYeah.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. Today, I'm very excited to introduce my special guest, Pete Lyons. Pete, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Hit the gas. All right. I like it. Here we go. In words and pictures, veteran motorsports journalist Pete Lyons has spent decades covering racing all over the world, including classics such as North America's original Unlimited Can-Am series, Formula One Grand Prix from Argentina to Watkins Glen, and sports car enduros at Daytona, Sebring, and Le Mans. Pete is a former editor of Race Car Magazine, and he's contributed to numerous enthusiast publications, including Autosport, Auto Week, Car and Driver, Road and Track, and many, many more. He's the author of 12 books published to date, and two more are underway. And he's won several prestigious honors, including the Motor Press Guild's Dean Bachelor Award twice, and the International Motor Press Association's Ken Purdy Award. In 2011, he gained the International Automotive Media Award for Lifetime Achievement. Along with his most recent books, including the upcoming Riverside International Raceway Photo History, plus his annual calendar and DVDs, the extensive archive of racing photography by Pete and his late father, Ozzy, can be seen at PeteLyons.com. Pete, I've told our listeners a little bit about you. Would you take a moment and share some more about your history? your career, your interest, and, of course, your passion for automobiles. Well, Mark, it really goes back to my dad, Ozzy. Um, He was the real car enthusiast in the family, and that went all the way back to his childhood. I remember him telling me stories of learning to drive when he was, you know, before he was 10 years old, and I I can't tell you the details anymore. (laughs) But he was born in 1910, which means he was growing up in the... 20s and 30s when cars were still new and exciting and novel. And he was fundamentally an engineer. He really enjoyed the mechanical side of cars. And that's how he approached his photography as well. So that when he, um, when he, after he got married in in 1939 and I was born, uh, he acquired a very old Rolls Royce car. He bought it in the 1950s, and it was then about 20 years old. It was a Phantom II Rolls-Royce, which he treated as his hobby car for the next 25 years. And that's the car I actually learned how to drive on. Wow. Uh, Summer of 1957, when I was 17, uh, Ozzy loaded the whole family, my my three sisters and mom and myself and him aboard, and we had a roof rack that he had erected on top of this big wire-wheeled old monster, and we drove it across the country, spending about three weeks doing it from uh, New York to California and back. And uh, that, you know, I, this had a non-synchromesh transmission, so that's how I learned to drive a car. And I got 10% as good as my dad was at changing it uh, silently, as you're supposed to. Well, there's not too many kids that get to learn how to drive in a Rolls-Royce. I know. I, I I often say that, but it, it creates the wrong impression. We were not that wealthy. This was just an old vintage car in those days that uh, didn't have any particular special value except to my dad. Well, with your father being a photographer, obviously that was a big influence on you growing up. When did you start to take a interest in photography, and how did your career start to progress from there? Probably as a result of that trip across the country, driving the car, I hadn't done any you know, I was still, you know, in my learning phase, and I didn't uh, have a hands-on experience of cars before that. 
during that trip, I can remember visualizing myself looking out over that long, long bonnet and pretending it was a Bentley at Le Mans. I can remember <laughs> just driving along quietly to myself thinking, I'm racing through the night in a Bentley at Le Mans. It, things gradually coalesced to the point where this was the most fun a person could have in his life was to follow these things. I used to go with my dad to races. He was the American uh, photographer for the English magazine Autosport, and so we would uh, go to uh, you know racetracks around New York City like Watkins Glen and Lime Rock and Bridgehampton. And then once a year, we would take a family vacation and go down to Sebring in Florida for the 12-hour race. Sure. And Dad would give me a camera and say, go over there and, and hold the camera this way and take this when a car comes by, and don't forget to pan with the car. I think one of the breakthroughs was one night when we came back from a race and were souping the film in Dad's darkroom. He was examining the pictures I'd taken, and he turned to me and said, you know, you're really good at panning. <laughs> and getting a, a clap on the back from your dad at that age is really quite important. Oh, sure. And he was all, already you know, contributing stories and photographs to Autosport, so uh, that's how I got involved in it, and uh, it turned out to be the most fun I could have. Oh, I'll bet. And all the adventures and, and to have your father give you those accolades. I've done something similar with my son. I've taken him to uh, a lot of car shows since he was quite young. He's 20 years old now. And I have really noticed over the last three, four years, I give him a camera to shoot pictures and we come back and I look at his images and many of them I say, I wish I had taken that picture. That was hey, good. Good for you. really creative eye the way he looks at things. So yeah, it's great. Let's move forward in your journey in life, and I always like to start with a success quote. It's a saying that's been very instrumental in forming your life and your success, and it's it's a great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars Yeah. So, Pete, take the wheel. The first thing that pops into my mind is something I usually say with a bit of jocularity, but uh, it, it's a quote from Fonjo, allegedly, and it, it's simply... Less break, more throttle. <laughs> the, the story is that Fonjo had a teammate that wasn't able to lap as fast as he was. And so he, the teammate said, there must be something wrong with this car, Juan. Can you take my car out and, and, and see what's wrong with it? So Fonjo went out and did a lap that was quicker than he had done in his own car and came back. And the, the poor fellow was mystified. He said, I don't understand. How do you do it? And Fonjo supposedly shrugged and says, Less break, more gas. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And it, it's a quick and easy and, and fun thing to say when somebody says, what's your advice? But, you know, I started thinking about it, and really that's the way you can approach life. Race driver instructors talk about carrying momentum through a corner. You know, don't use the brakes quite so hard. Keep the speed up. You might think going in, as you turn in, you might think, oh, I'm still too fast, but stay with it and the thing will go through the corner faster. Well, absolutely. I used to race vintage cars and I had a good friend, Dick Buckingham, who raced in my class, which were Formula Juniors. Mm -hmm. And he'd been doing it a long time. And I remember one day I was frustrated. I just wasn't going any faster. And he said something similar. He said, well, wait later to break before you go mm -hmm. into the corners. And I thought I was waiting as long as I could, but I just, he said, just count 1,001 and then hit the brakes. And then on the next lap, 1,001, 1,002, and hit the brakes. How have you incorporated that success quote into your business and your career, Pete? I would say that it has to do with just going ahead and trying something. The idea that, you know, I, I could pack up and... First, I had a Volvo station wagon, then I turned it into a Ford van that I would travel around the country living in, reporting on races for autosport in England. It isn't something that most people would think that they can do. To me, it seemed perfectly natural once I got into it. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity came along to do Formula One in Europe for two different magazines, and I, and I went ahead and did that. You know, any, any of those points... Somebody could say to themselves, oh, that's a little too ambitious. I better not try that. I'll just stay back in something that's safe and comfortable. But, you know, if you push yourself forward and do it, lo and behold, you can do it. Absolutely. And it's a great message for entrepreneurs, especially young entrepreneurs listening to Cars yeah, to this interview is just step out of your comfort zone and do it. Yes. 
And it goes back to the, the driving analogy, too. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not a very good racetrack driver, but I have always had ambitions to be. And so I've studied it, and I can see that, you know, there's a point entering a corner where you have to commit to it. And if you do commit to it and you don't panic and you, and you stay fluid on the controls, you'll get through it fine. That's a great analogy. Would you share with us a story that instigated your passion for cars? Perhaps tell us that pivotal moment when you really knew you were a car guy. Let me start by saying I'm not really a car guy. I'm a racing car guy. Oh, I love it. Okay. You know, racing cars excite me. Uh, street cars, you know, I admire them. I've had them. I love to drive them, but they're not passionate for me. Mm-hmm. You know, point me at a race car and I just, my eyes go bright. And that, I, on my website, I tell a story of being about probably 12 years old out at Bridgehampton Raceway. And at that point, it was simply a vacation outing. You know, Dad would go to the races, and he would take me and walk me around, but mostly my mind was back at the beach where my sisters were. Because these, these cars were something I'd never experienced. They're too big, they were too loud, they were going too fast, and they are just something I didn't understand. But there was a little Cooper Formula 3 car. In those days, there was these little tiny uh, bullet-shaped things with uh, four exposed skinny wheels and a motorcycle engine in the back. And somebody offered to let little Pete sit on it, so I climbed into it. And I can remember the feeling, this one fits me. (laughs) And I, I can't say I became an automotive enthusiast right there and then, but it planted the seed, I think, that kept growing. Oh, yeah. You know, I talk about that. I spoke about that, rather, in a a past blog about the Pebble Beach and Laguna Seca vintage races and the importance of uh, letting a kid sit in your car if you're a racer and how it can be a pivotal moment. In your case, that was. Absolutely. I've written a column about that myself, and I urge people to take kids to events. You know, even if they seem bored, even if they don't really... If you don't see signs of them responding, you know how kids are. They, they, uh, they act cool right. and don't know what seed you've succeeded in planting until quite some time later. Pete, what I want to do now is take a look at some of the roads you've driven down and really crawl under the hood and get our hands a little dirty, perhaps, and have you share with our listeners a huge challenge or even a great failure that you've faced in your career that pushed you to a breaking point But more importantly, share with us how you overcame that situation and what you learned from it. I'm not sure I've faced a breaking point per se, or perhaps I wasn't aware of it at the time. (laughs) I can remember wanting, before I'd ever done a book, I'd done thousands of magazine articles, but I'd never done a book. And I kept uh, thinking, gosh, it's time for me to write a book. Oh boy, that seems so daunting. And then I happened to be at a dinner party somewhere where the guy next to me was a book publisher, and we started talking, and he he said, you know, we need to do a book about Lamborghinis. Would you be interested? I said, yes, I would be interested. (laughs) And I went away thinking, oh, boy, I've committed myself now. So I I talked to an editor friend of mine, who um, Art Eastman, who was at Vintage Motorsport Magazine in those days, and he said, look, Pete, writing a book is just like eating an elephant with a spoon. You just do it bite by bite. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that, that, that was funny enough to stick in my mind. And so I spent the next several months writing the book about Lamborghini, thinking, okay, spoonful by spoonful, I can do this. And uh, I'm quite pleased with that book. It was the first book I'd done. Uh, it was 1988, and uh, I think it still stands up as a pretty decent piece of work. And I've done you know, a dozen cents. Well, there's a couple of golden nuggets in your comments there. One is, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? I had a guest on last week that that was a comment that he said when things get overwhelming. And the other one was just committing. You had somebody that offered it to you, and you said yes. And sometimes just committing and telling the people around you that you're going to do something adds that pressure to your goals and requires you to do it because keeping goals to yourself really uh, usually don't amount to a whole a whole lot. So those are great stories. Let's shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum and share a story when you had a real aha moment in your career. 
Tell us about that time and you really realize that, you know what, I think this is really, I'm going to make it. This is going to make it. What I want to do is right for me. And tell us the steps you took to turn that aha moment into a success. When you ask about an aha moment, I go back to this summer I was, I had just graduated from high school in 1958. And a high school friend of mine had, with his father, they had an MGPC, and his, the dad was a corner worker at uh, races. So we all three of us went out to Lime Rock in Connecticut, which is, I don't know, an hour's drive away from us. And I spent the whole race uh, at their corner station, and I had a camera with me, and so I did a few photographs. And at one point, a Volvo sedan stopped right in front of us, and the driver got out, and he climbed underneath, he crawled underneath the car, and he started draining the fuel tank. And then he trotted back across the infield to the pits and came back with a can of gas because during the previous pit stop, they had uh, put water in the gas tank instead of fuel. Oh, no. And so I, I photographed this whole operation, and I can remember setting up a photo with him underneath the car. And then uh, I waited until a sister car, another Volvo, came by, so it was in the background, and I had more of a story to tell, and then I took that photograph. And that was one of the photographs I sent into Autosport that, uh, you know, the next week. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, they seized that picture and, and printed it. And I can remember the thrill to this day of receiving the magazine in the mail, having come across the ocean from England, and my photograph had been published. That, that is a thrill that never dies. It, it's still with me. Whenever I open a magazine and I see a story I've written or a, mag- or a photograph I've taken, it's the same thrill that I had when I was 18 years old. Well, that's so wonderful to be able to have continuing aha moments in your career. Yeah. That tells me that you really love what you're doing. You, you also have uh, non-aha moments, like, why do those idiots mess up my manuscript? <laughs> I understand that, too. But uh... Pete, tell us about your first very special car a car that really meant something to you, and maybe share some me- special memories you had with that vehicle. I've only had one truly special car in my life. In 1973, when I uh, left the Can-Am series in order to transition over to Formula One, I knew I was going to spend the summer in Europe and I would need wheels, and my first thought was to, gee, why don't I get a Lotus or a Porsche? That, that would be perfect for me. But then I thought, I've, I've known several of the Can-Am drivers who made a business, a little side business, of importing a European car to the States for the summer and then selling it to some starry-eyed American enthusiast. And so I thought, I'll just do that in reverse. And so what's the most outrageous American car you can think of? Uh, so I bought a bright red 1973 Stingray Coupe, and I had it shipped to Europe. I picked it up on the docks at Rotterdam, and I drove it right away to Spa to the 1,000 kilometers race. And then the next weekend was the Targa Florio all the way down in Sicily. And then the following weekend was the Monaco Grand Prix. And so my first two weeks with that car, I covered a lot of Europe at progressively higher speeds as I broke in the engine. Honestly, what went wrong with my plan to make some money off the car at the end of the year was I fell in love with the damn thing. <laughs> Uh-oh. You know, I I had only once or twice before driven a Corvette, and it wasn't long enough to really think much about it. But I found just settling into that cockpit and uh, belting down the Autostrada at, you know, 115 miles an hour or something was just so much fun, so satisfying, so enjoyable that I just couldn't bear the thought of selling the car. The low, sharp nose, but still had the uh, ducktail. Uh, the camback tail, as I think of it. And I think that was a nice balance of looks. Oh, yeah. What about seller's remorse? Is there a vehicle you've had that you sold that you really wish you could have back? Well, it goes back to that Corvette, too. And this is not serious. I don't seriously want another one like it because Corvettes have gotten so much better over the years. But still, I have this daydream idea that I could find a 73 Corvette just like mine and fix it up a little better, like, you know, put better rubber on it, better brakes, uh, better seating maybe. Sure. But then I think, you know, there's no way I can cruise the highways of America at 115 miles an hour. So. No, no, you'd have to take it to the track to enjoy those speeds. Yeah. 
driving that in Europe kind of spoiled me. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for those of us who've been able to go over there and drive fast on the Autobahn and right. uh, the speeds, yeah, it is it is a spoiler. And the drivers over there are a lot more careful in the left lane, that's for sure. They they stay Absolutely. to the right. right. Is there a current project that you're working on right now that really has you excited and fired up? Yes, uh, I'll answer that in two ways. Uh, I've just now, we're in the last stages of finishing a book on the old Riverside International Raceway here in California. It's a photo history, basically, with enough text to tie everything together. And I worked hard at finding, with my wife and I, Lorna and I both worked very hard trying to find photographs that would uh, tell the story that hadn't been seen before. And then I wrote quite a lot of text, and the, the former art director at Road and Track, who is Richard Barron, is a magnificently talented designer. He's done the book. And it'll be published very shortly. We're, we're in the final stages of that. And then I've started work already for David Bull Publishing on a book about the shadow race cars that were uh, the American cars built during the 1970s. Oh, yeah. They started out with a little tiny tire car in 1970 and then gradually became more and more conventional but also more and more successful to the point where they did win the Can-Am Championship in 1974. And in Formula One, they were fast but fragile until one day in Austria, uh, Alan Jones won a race for Shadow, a Grand Prix race. And so uh, they also competed in Formula 5000 and a couple of other uh, it's a spinoff of the Can-Am as well. So the Don Nichols, who started that, is uh, close to 90 now, but he's still active every day in Salinas, California, in his shop. And so Lauren and I have spent uh, a lot of time with Don and a lot of time with the people who currently own his old cars and race, vintage race them. And through them, we've met a lot of the people who used to work for Shadow Cars, and there's a magnificent story there. It's a, it's a fascinating story, and I'm really keen to tell it. Well, your books, when will they be available? The Riverside book, the publisher is aiming to have it available for Christmas. Great. And the Shadow book, we're, we're still farther out on that. Mm -hmm. It would be hard to say exactly when we can do that. Yeah. Well, I know David. David bull has been a guest on Cars, yeah, one of the very first guests, so... Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, so he's a great person to work with, a wonderful, inspirational man, for sure. Exactly. It's his commitment to quality and his enthusiasm that are so you know appealing to somebody like me. And I assume that our listeners can find these books on your website when they're out? When when they're available, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, BeatLions.com has some of my other books at the moment, but it's just a little premature to start advertising the uh, Riverside book. Okay, well, well, we'll have all those things on the show notes page, links to your site, so that people can go and keep abreast of when those books come out so they can make sure they're under the Christmas tree for the enthusiasts in their life. Great, thank you. Here's an interesting question. If you were a car, what kind of car would you be and why? That's easy. I'm a Ferrari. <laughs> okay, and why are you a Ferrari, Pete? Um, it, that's the thing that springs to mind. I mean, I ask my subconscious what the answer is, and it pops up. Yeah. Um, I I did a um, I did a column once where I talked about my ideal car, and I ended up selecting a Ferrari Testarossa, the old pontoon fendered front engine V12 car. Sure. Uh, you know, dates from the late 50s, which is the period of time when I first became really passionate about motorsports. And I got a phone call, I think, from David Love, a vintage racer who owned one of them, and he invited me to come to what is now Sonoma Raceway, Sears Point, and for an open test day. And he said, I'll let you drive my, my Testarossa. I <laughs> who is this really? But I made a trip up there, and David plugged me into his Testarossa, and I did quite a few laps of the track that day. Wow. Feeling out this dream car. Yes, it's old-fashioned. Yes, it's dated. Yes, other cars run rings around it. And yes, it's expensive. It's, uh, it's not practical. You certainly wouldn't want to have an accident in it. But still, there's something about a car like that that just fires your blood up. Oh and yeah. You drive it and you you start breathing heavily and you start thinking of the Millimedia and the wide open roads of Europe back in the day and and it just is uh it, it it if you haven't experienced it you can only dream about it but it's just it just that that particular car brings back all of the 
passion I used to feel for racing back in the day. Oh, yeah. They're beautiful cars. Years ago, I got to photograph one. My son was only four years old at the time. It was Pete Lovely's car and yeah. Bush Dennison's car. And I've got Christmas pictures of him with my little girl sitting in that car. And we just saw that car again last weekend on the lawn at Pebble Beach. Oh, great. Along with 20 others. So, yes. great car, great choice. So, Pete, we're up to what I call the last lap. And being a racer and being around racing, you know what that means. The white flag is out. And this is where I fire off a series of questions. And you give our listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So, are you ready? Uh, I'll try. Okay, here we go. What is the best automotive advice you've ever received? The word glide. Glide. I was, I, I've taken a, a, quite a few uh, driver's schools, and one of the best was, uh, gosh, Cooper. Bill Cooper, I think, was his name. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were talking about how I was driving a car around a track, and he used the word glide. He says, and it goes back to what I said earlier about the you know less brake, more gas, more throttle. Um, it was a remarkably helpful word. He says you you approach the turn and you glide through it. Hmm. I think he had probably observed some white knuckle on my part, kind of being jerky with the controls, uncertain, um, not fluid. Mm-hmm. And the word when he used that word, it it kind of reoriented me, reset me, and I I, I tried some laps thinking of the term gliding. And I think it helped a lot. And I've, I've come away with that. You asked me, and I haven't thought of that in 20 years, but that it, it meant something to me when he said that. It's great advice. I had a similar occasion on a, a track with a driving instructor saying, don't grab the wheel so tight. Yeah, exactly. Pull, pull your palms off the wheel. And uh, it's very okay. similar. Yeah, great advice. Uh, Bob Bondurant school uh, used to teach you to uh, don't grab the shift lever back in the days when cars had shift levers. Simply rest your palm on the top of the knob and move it with your palm using just friction and the little cup effect of your palm. Don't grab it and snatch it and jam it. Right. Kind of like uh, they tell you in driving school, put an egg between your foot and the gas pedal and don't break the egg. (laughs) Sure, sure. Very similar. Would you share one of your personal habits that you believe has contributed to your success? Um, I've got a lot of personal habits I don't want to share with you. <laughs> Maybe just but, the good um, ones. I try to be a good listener. I've sometimes noticed while I'm idly listening to someone else inter- conducting an interview that we're hearing far too much of the interviewer, and he doesn't leave the interviewee enough time to say anything. <laughs> and so I I try hard to simply ask a question and then shut up and listen to the answer I've asked for. I think that that tends to warm people up and they'll start talking to me more. Oh, absolutely. I shared this story with another guest I had years and years ago. I worked with a young woman who spoke a lot. She would not listen. And one time I got so frustrated. I said, would, would you just stop talking and listen to me for a moment? And she <laughs> said, oh, I can listen and talk at the same time. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, right. Exactly. So listening is definitely a great skill. Well, that particularly if you've, if you've sat somebody like, you know, some famous individual down in front of you and they've, they're willing to give you a few minutes of their time, they don't want to sit there and listen to you. So ask them a question and, hear, and then shut up. And listen. Great. That's great advice. Do you have a resource that you could share with our listeners that you're really fond of? Maybe it's a website that you go to frequently or a book, a magazine. Well, I do have a lot of websites that I have bookmarked and I go to, and not only in the automotive world, but um, in in the racing field, I oddly enough, I, I often go to Joe Sayward's Formula One blog, A-W-A-R-D. Um, and it's not because he and I are interested necessarily in the same things. He's very keen on politics and finance. Whereas I'd like him to put in a little bit more about technology and driving. At the same time, I find him very engaging. He's 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 there at all the races. He publishes a magazine an e magazine about it. He seems to know all the players, and he's got a you know a, a logical head on his shoulders. And so that I 
I get quite a lot out of it that, you know, if I were there, I would be pursuing other things so that uh, his insights are something new and different to me. So I, I find I would respond to that. Great. Pete, is there a book that you've recently read that you really enjoyed that you could share with our listeners? I wish I had more time to read. <laughs> don't we all? Yeah. No, I, I, I would hold back from that one. I, I, <laughs> okay. don't, I don't have any titles to share with you. Sorry. Well, how about this question? I'll throw something different in here. You've written a lot of books. Name one of your books that you're really fond of that you think our listeners should read. If you had to pick one. I'm very fond of the first of the three Can-Am books I did. It was done for motor books in 1995, and it's simply called Can-Am, C-A-N hyphen A-M. That is a book that tells the entire story of the nine years of the Can-Am series that was so critical in me becoming a journalist. My wife and I worked very hard on that book. She did all the data pages at the back. It's out of print now except for uh, a few copies we just by chance came across not too long ago. We're hidden away behind something else. We don't have any copies left, mm. but they are available online as used books. I feel very, very good about that book. I'm pleased about it. I think it's a, it's a, a good, solid look at a time of life that was important to a lot of us. Amazing, amazing cars, amazing time period, just wide open. But, you know, the upcoming Riverside book is great, too. Well, of course, and Christmas is coming as well, so we'll, we'll keep our eyes for that. Right. Do, do you have any interesting hobbies outside of your passion for cars? I'm very keen on photography. This wasn't true in my youth, even though Dad taught me how to use cameras and develop film and so on. It's only been in the last, you know, 30 years or so that I've... And let, let me step back. I, I did a lot of photography in the racing days, but it really was to support my writing because, mm -hmm. you know, I was a one-man band. I would do supplied both the words and the photos and so I would you know make an effort to make you know good photos and I still am pleased with the work I did in those days but I can't say I was really a student of photography the way I am now well I'll remind our listeners that you can find links to these resources Pete has shared with us at carsyad.com slash Pete Lyons L-Y-O-N-S just put Pete in the search box and his show notes page will pop up and you can find links to everything including Pete's website all right, Pete, we're up to the checkered flag. You know what that means. The race is almost over. And this last question can be a real doozy for some people. If you could only have one collector car in your garage, and it's something you can't sell to buy a bunch of other cars with, and money's no object, I'm going to buy you whatever you want, what would that car be and why? Well, I'm, I guess I would say Ferrari again, although I've never driven one. I, I'm very keen on the appearance of the 458 Italia. Oh, That's yeah. A gorgeous piece of work. And so, as a pure object of lust to have, you know, in my possession, in my garage, and occasionally drive it, I, I guess I'd nominate that. However, there are about 20 other cars that <laughs> I, I could uh, take, uh, gladly accept as substitutes. Well, of course, and if I ask the question that way, it'd be far too easy to answer. Pick, I know, right. pick 20 cars you want to have in your garage. So right, right. that's why I always say one. When I was at uh, Laguna Seca last week, I got to follow a La Ferrari over the uh, Laurel Grade down to the racetrack. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. oh, my goodness, amazing car. But I've, I've heard from many, many people the 458 is just a wonderful car to drive. Mm -hmm. So great choice. What color would you pick? Oh, red, of course. Oh, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. I was in a group of people around a green Ferrari at Monterey one year during the Historics. The owner was explaining to them people about the car, and then somebody said, well, yeah, but why is it green? Ferraris are supposed to be red. And the guy says, well, both of my other Ferraris are red, so I thought I'd have something different. <laughs> I just watched a, a special this week in my wife tape for me on drive tv about a green dino ferrari that was stolen and buried in a backyard i don't know if you've heard that story but uh it was stolen in los angeles and actually buried and then they found it about three years later dug it up and a guy restored it and it's oh. uh, a beautiful metallic green color so well pete you've taken us on a great ride today and i've really enjoyed your stories i want to thank you for sharing your journey with me and with the listeners would you give our listeners one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that Italia? And then let us know what's the best way we can find out more about you 
your career and your business, and then we'll say goodbye. Guidance. I'm thinking uh, back in the days when I was a journalist, if, if uh, you know, a racing journalist covering Formula One races and so on, I wish I had gone to more races, talked to more people, interviewed more drivers, photographed, done more photography of the cars and from different angles, and then kept all of my film. You know, I, I failed on a number of those scores, all of those scores, and now if I had it to do over again, I would, but I'd do more of it. I have a biography you know, set up on my website, which is PeteLyons.com. That basically tells you know, whatever you need to know, and I'm also on Facebook. I have a Facebook presence. Oh, great. Well, listeners, I'll remind you, you can find links to everything we talked about today here at carsyad.com slash Pete Lyons. Look, look Pete up in the search bar and you'll find his show notes page and links to everything that he shared with us. Pete, I want to thank you for being so generous with your time and your expertise and sharing your experiences with our listeners. Until we talk again, we'll see you down the road. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.